I want to just go to Anthony Frieda, artist and activist. Anthony? Yes, Catherine. Hi, how are you? Good, can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me okay? You sound great. Oh, good. Um, thank you so much for joining me on Organic News on Awake Radio. My pleasure. Um, I met you, um, let's see, when was it? September? When was the uh, a Gerald, uh, Gerald Salente's Occupy piece? That was, wasn't it in September, I believe? Yes, yes, it was September. Um, and it was, uh, it was a great day. It was great meeting you. Uh, yes. Um, so talk, yeah, talk a little bit about Occupy Peace and why you were attending that event. Occupy Peace was uh, Gerald Salente of the Trends Research, the Trends Forecaster uh, Journal um, in, in Kingston, the most historic uh, intersection in Kingston, New York, between J uh, John and Wall Streets. And... Um, yeah, I mean, I, it was a decent turnout. Of course, you know, we could always use more people in the fight for uh, truth and justice. <laughs> yeah. Well, the turnout was disappointing because, listen, you know, peace is a tough sell in the age of Obama, and that's what Gerald found out the hard way. Uh, he put $100,000 of his own money to that um, tent, and uh, he, did, I mean, you know, the speakers were amazed. I mean, you saw them. You know, he got uh, Ralph Nader. And I invited Cindy Sheehan, my friend. Yeah. She came, flew out from California. Yeah, I love Cindy. I love. I, I mean, Ralph, I don't know, but Cindy Sheehan, I know. I mean, yeah, I, he had Gary Noel there, who's yeah. great, and he had, uh, he had he had a bunch of just really great dynamic speakers. And um, you know, the um, the whole idea of the peace movement, as you know, is it's a morally based movement. So it's, it's hard to get. Um, to get traction in a, in a political environment because it's not a political movement. It's, it's, it's a, it has a moral base to it. The whole idea is, is uh, <clears throat> doing what's right, not what's politically correct. So, you know, I mean, we're basically being, remaining consistent in our platform the same way we, we were towards the Bush administration. We're holding uh, Obama's administration to the same standards. But now all of a sudden the, uh, the Democrats who... Where a lot of my friends, I, I thought they were would be consistent and hold Obama to the same standard, but they don't. They hold him to a different standard. I mean, if, if Bush was blowing up a ninety percent civilian casualty rate in his drone bombing campaign, they'd be screaming bloody murder. Obama does it, and eh, you know, who says who says that about like it, like le, you know lesser re reaction because Obama is doing it. Everywhere. I mean, I see it everywhere. They don't care. That's why nobody shows up. It, 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 the biggest uh, peace demonstrations in human history were before the Iraq war. It wasn't that long ago. There was millions of people in organized demonstrations all over the world. And um, it's because this, uh, you know, it was it was a Republican administration. So there, traditionally the, the, the peace movement is uh, Democratic or left-leaning. Um, or you know, uh, movement. So they look at it in political terms, the left-right paradigm. When is a when is a guy who is, has left cover and is a Democrat and is half black in, in the in the office, and he's the one committing the war crimes. They they have a hard time um, uh, standing out up against it because it, that's their guy. It's if people have blind spots for sure. Yeah, and it's hypocrisy on both sides. I mean, the same. Republicans were screaming about, um, or now they're screaming about, you know, this infringement upon our, our civil liberties by the Patriot Act and um, illegal surveillance and the TSA. It was Bush who started all that. I mean, yeah, Obama continued it and expanded it even, even though he said he was going to do the opposite. Uh, so it's hypocrisy everywhere. We live in a land of hypocrisy. It's hidden in plain sight, and nobody can see it. That's why I love Gerald. He calls himself political atheist. And that's what I am, because I think once you subscribe to a certain party platform, you know, all of your, your moral groundings and convictions become framed in a partisan context. You no longer can stand for anything because partisanship is tribalism, and that tribalism trumps everything. I, um, I say this a lot um, 
because it's just true. Like from, I mean, from where I uh, came from, I like for me it was always a health issue. Like I felt at a really early age that there was kind of a a health crisis, like a a fitness crisis. Like people just didn't seem to really be um, fit, like responsive to things. I mean, like right in front of my face, things would be happening that really called and demanded the immediate response of, of the people around and the response was absolutely zero, <laughs> which is what, what like made me turn to not just, you know, physical health and fitness, but psychological, you know, emotional health and fitness because, I mean, you know, I have to say it because it's the truth. I, I mean, I wanted nothing more than to turn out like the people I was surrounded by. That was my biggest fear in life. Wow. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, you, can, you look around. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. People are, I mean, they have a blank stare. They're on multiple either psychotropic drugs or sleeping, just, you know, ambient or drinking too much. Or they're, everybody's using some sort of substance to get through life, and it's just, it's, it's having an effect on all of us. I mean, the course of society, like I say, just look around you. Everybody knows somebody who's, you know, a drug addict or addicted to prescription drugs or is taking Ambien or is taking multiple psychotropic drugs. I mean, we all know. Everybody has them in their family. And people yeah. don't, they don't realize that consumerism is a drug. And, uh, you know, television consumption <laughs> is a drug. That's right. Those are all drugs. Video games are drugs. These are all distractions and diversions, and they're, um, you know, being addicted to adrenaline. Adrenaline is a drug. It's a naturally uh, formed drug in your brain, but you can get addicted to that, too. And these neural pathways that you form from watching violent video games desensitize you to violence and give you a, a, a pleasure response when you see violence, so you don't care when you see, you know, these drone bombings happening, because you just, you're associating pleasure with that. It's happening on a subconscious level. But the kids are being trained. Their brains are being trained to, to be desensitized specifically to a specific kind of violence. So seeing as that you just mentioned that, which um, just made me think of uh, the documentary called Drone, which I kind of, I just was watching, um, I think it was the day before yesterday. Did you see it? I saw the trailer. It looks great. Yeah, it's on uh, Netflix. <laughs> Okay. And um, Brandon Bryant, who's in it, and I, I interviewed him, it has to be two years ago. Yeah, I was uh, writing with him on Facebook. Hopefully he'll be back on pretty soon. But, you, you know, this, this whole idea of the military now involved in gaming, you know, video games, and trying to recruit teenage video gamers to uh, man, you know, remote controlled drones that will kill and take out innocent people and, and despite you know what people think that they're going after terrorists that is absolutely not the case because you know as as I've interviewed so many people and they all say the same thing the country this country creates and funds terrorism just to keep this charade of this war ongoing so yeah. um, you know weapons industries can rack in the profits yeah these wars create surplus evil under the guise of destroying evil so we what have we, what have, what have we done I mean what has the war on terror done it's created the most extreme expression of anti-americanism and Islamic fundamentalism in the form of ISIS that didn't exist before the war on terror now they're rampaging all over the world so that's the result of the war on terror is creating terror. It's not killing, ending terror. It's making it stronger and more powerful and spreading it all over Europe and all over the world. Talk about addiction, you know. I mean, the corporations are completely like profit junkies. Yeah, and they also they just want to keep doubling down. Every time it fails and, and the terror spreads, they, you know, the answer is what's the answer? More of the same. We didn't we didn't kill enough people. We didn't destroy enough countries. I mean, that's literally what Hillary said was, you know, with the Benghazi thing. She was, we didn't, you know, we should have killed more people. We should have, we should have destroyed, we should have had more wars. I mean, this is, this is the madness 
of war. I mean, for the 21st century, and the best solution we could come up with is bombing, you know, bombing a problem. There's 12 countries right now bombing uh, Syria. 12 countries. The, 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 you know, he's supposed to be the, the best leaders, the brightest people in our world, the most powerful people. The best idea they come up with is dropping bombs on a place. Right. It's, you know, it, it's amazing. Um, like, I, I talk about natural law a lot also. And um, exactly. I mean, they're, they're supposed to be uh, these intelligent people, and yet they act most from their most uh, base, uh, dense, uh, I don't know, vibration or, you know, I'm, I'm trying like not to get into like all of this um, uh, enlightened yoga meditation kind of language, you know. Okay, it's okay. But, uh, you know, however you can describe it, but it is, it is all psychological, it comes down to, you know, these are psycho, psychopathologies that, that manifest themselves on a sociological and cultural uh level, uh, but they're really the same as, some, as you know, as a, a sick uh, mind in one person. It's the same pathology, it's just that it's spread across an entire society. So I'm looking, I'm on your um, your website, and uh, is it, the the one with the dollar bill, is, I'm trying to see who that who that is. Um, uh, I'm trying, I'm going to try to take a guess. Okay, <laughs> I'm not sure which one. It's either, it's, is it, no, it's not Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, that was the Darwin. Okay, it's Darwin. That was the evolution uh, of money, yeah, the Darwin. That was for the piece I did for the New York Times, but um, I, I, I wanted to ask you something. I said, you, you were hanging out with Roger Waters? Yeah, you saw that, <laughs> right? Oh, who was that? He's one of my heroes. Oh, are you, uh, um, well, let's see, um. You know, the British journalist, Andy Worthington, who's been doing a lot of, um, you know, trying to get the word out on closing Guantanamo, and he was working really hard to get Shaka Ama, who was indefinitely detained in Guantanamo for 14 years without trial or charge and being tortured. Now, Obama closed Guantanamo, Kat, didn't you hear? Seven years ago. You know, well... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I know, right? Um, and so, uh, Roger Waters, you know, he's, he's a huge political guy, which is why I've always liked him, which I, I, the reason why I always loved Pink Floyd's always been one of my all time favorite bands. Yeah, me too. And, um, so Roger Waters actually came to Andy Worthington's event two years ago. The first time I, I met him just, you know, briefly, and it was a, a larger event. Uh, at the All Souls Church on Lexington and 80th Street, um, and he was pretty much, like, kind of on the DL. Uh, they showed a documentary called Doctors of the Dark Side and how psychologists and medical doctors are, are now part were p participating in torture. And um, he didn't come to the this event last year, but he did come this year um, in a, a much smaller uh, setting, at the Revolution Books, and um, and you know his presence was much more known, and he spoke out. You know he asked Andy a question, and um, and I got to take my picture with him. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, yeah. he's got a lot of guts because obviously he takes a lot of heat for taking a moral position because his, his positions may not be politically expedient, and and he doesn't care, and that, that you have yeah. to respect that. Well, I mean, he doesn't have to answer to anybody. God bless him. I mean, you know, we should all be in that position. But, I mean, you know, I, I think we can be in that position if, if the people just chose to, if, if they, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, don't, I believe that we, we can. I, I mean, if enough people really wanted to, we could just really pull the plug on the system really effortlessly if, if we yeah, have listen, there's more of us than them. You know, we, we have this power that we, for some reason, we just seem to just give it away. I mean, right. whatever, whatever rights we have, we give away. I mean, right. my God, we just we let them just take the, the, the little freedoms and balance of power we have against the, the monolith of this government. And even that, they don't want us to have. The Bill of Rights is gone. They've turned it from rights into privileges. I've, I've had right. a sense of, you know, uh, Presentations by by real constitutional scholars, not Obama, real ones who are actually telling the truth and understand the law. 
take a break the Patriot Act down line by line and describe how it literally dismantles the Bill of Rights and literally turns your rights into nothing. They all, all they have to do is say you're a terrorist. They take away all your rights. They don't need evidence. They don't need charges. And so exactly. You can't defend yourself. You, people get on these terrorists and they, they don't even have a gun on them and they have no right to defend themselves. It's insane. Um... I, so I wanted to, you know, say that you know, back in the 70s, like, I felt all of this stuff. Like, I felt that what should be our rights were were being made to be luxuries and that, uh, you know, like, what we're entitled to, you know, we're made to feel like, you know, you know criminals for, like, wanting what's rightfully ours because you mentioned... Uh, you know, giving our power away. And, yeah. you know, th- these are things that I've tried to point out and, you know, tell people literally for decades. Since the 70s, I studied all about this stuff. Read, t- you know, um, not not so much like on this global scale that, that it is, you know, now, because, I mean, I was young and I didn't know any of this stuff then, but, you know, just in, in my smaller circle, you could just see the kind of scaled down version of, yeah. of people and the way that they, they literally have very little self-worth. Yeah, well, they've been they've been trained that way. I mean, this is this is sophisticated, you know, branding techniques, sophisticated psychological warfare against the population, waged over decades. And you, you know, very intuitive to have picked that up in the seventies. You're way ahead of the curve. Um, you just, I think, you sensed it innately, and that was that was brilliant because a lot of people didn't see this coming. Very few, and well, now a lot of people do, but it's almost too late. It was, it, I mean, I was, I felt like I was forced to because of just the experiences that I had then. I mean, it, you know, I, I, I literally was just shaken awake. I was forced, yeah, you know, to, to I mean, you know, your body just does it automatically, you know, um, and, uh, I mean, well, and yeah. people who have come firsthand contact with the system. They know, they know this. it's all gone. Once you're actually in there and you see the belly of the beast, man, you know, it's it's old. Like, so, you know, it, it, it's like uh, Rikers Island, you know. I mean, you're, you're just literally uh, experiencing, um, you know, the, the same kind of experiences people have on Rikers Island or even in Guantanamo, for God's sake. And, you know, everybody is in on it. I mean, everyone is in on kind of, uh, you know, robbing from the young instead of, you know, instead of raising the young to be like all they could be, you know, it's, you know, it's normal to just raise people to just have a job and pay your bills and go along rather than really being this, you know, to use, uh, I believe it was, um, Abraham Maslow's uh, term, self-actualization. Like, I was a psych major because, you know, I was always trying to get people to write, like, own their power. And if I could, you know, mention yoga practice, which, like, you know, just fitness in general, I was always trying to get people to be more, like, physically and emotionally fit and get in, you know, because what people don't realize is how the system makes healthy parts, you know, healthy anger, healthy rebellion, you know, healthy um, civil, you know, civil disobedience, a crime. And so people are literally, like, shrunken down, and the, the healthy parts of them they are made to feel is, like, bad or they're a criminal or guilty or ashamed for having these normal, healthy parts. And so instead of those emotional parts getting exercised and being taught to be exercised, they're getting the opposite of exercise, and then they they be, they atrophy. Yeah. Which is how the powers and and then that you know which which gives the powers that be. You know, so so what what we're not using inside of ourselves and the emotions and the energy that we're not utilizing inside of ourselves, you know, guess who's using and using it against us? 
And then right. we're, right. we're shrinking and shrinking more and more while their, expand, their psychosis is expanding more and more. Exactly. And, and the other thing they do is they'll channel whatever passion and we have left into meaningless causes, causes that do nothing but divide us even further and give them more power. Right, and they yeah. do that by media manipulation. I mean, we see it every day. Every, I mean, I've never seen the country more divided than it is now. And it's not by accident. These things don't happen by accident. They happen by repetitive, coordinated, concerted campaigns to divide us along race, divide us along sexual lines, divide us along political lines. I mean, my God, everybody hates each other. Just go on Facebook for two minutes. It's, you can't <laughs> see ample evidence of that. Uh, and it's all of our energy and our hatred is... is and we, we feel there's something wrong, we're angry, but we let them manipulate us and channel it to places where, where we're yelling at each other instead of yelling at them, the people right. who are actually destroying the planet. I'm telling you, like, that's, you know, that is a, another thing. Smart like, man, it's just smart, cat. they're smarter than we are. They understand human psychology. It all comes down to psychology. It does. It, it com- like, I mean, I use the word fitness, but it's the same. I mean, it's the same thing. Like, I, like... That, you know, it was a no-brainer that just fitness was the most important thing. Physical and just mental fitness, you know, feeling good about yourself, uh, you know, having, like, you know, a, a healthy amount of self-worth. And people walk around, like, the, the way the way that I've, I've come to describe it is, um, uh, like, like, when, if someone gets injured or, uh, ill and they 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 start to go into shock or or like hypothermia uh like they they're losing blood they're bleeding out the first thing that goes is their mental status they go into like an altered state of mental status which then you know perpetuates them into like making you know more poor choices and so like i've i've kind of like realized that that's the normal state that people are living at today like yeah. this deficient mental status which you know like like a debt it's it's like a health debt like people are walking around in a health deficiency a mental emotional health deficiency which keeps them constantly impaired uh you know like and and, and addicted constantly old you know stuck in a vicious cycle of always making more and more poor choices yeah and and you know how, how do people get out of it I mean, you know, unless we unplug from the yeah. powers that be, it, we're never going to do it. We literally have to just unplug from these people. Yeah, well, that we're unplug is the word. I mean, we're being channeled into these uh, electronic ghettos, and where they can control us and monitor us, like Facebook and places like that, where any kind of dissent is really just. You know, they laugh at it because they're watching it and they're controlling it and they can turn it off. They can, you know, stop your Facebook page. They control it. It's not, it's not real freedom. It's, 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 a, it's an illusion of freedom. It's an illusion of, of discussion. They even decide what gets, you know, to show up on your Facebook page. So you don't have the freedom you think you have. You know what? I, you ever see that movie, um, uh, The Never Ending Story? Remember that one in the 70s? Oh, uh, possibly. Yeah. Anyway, is it? The whole premise of the movie is this, there's this thing coming that's going to destroy humanity, and it's called the nothing. And it's just this black cloud of just the nothing is coming. And I feel like that's what we're experiencing now. It's just it's the nothing. You look around, and people have nothing. They don't stand for anything. And if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for anything, right? And they don't they don't have any beliefs. They have no fire in their eyes. They have no passion for anything real. Other than Sports and distractions and, and and petty bickering and the big picture is completely lost on them and it's the nothing they're just it's the nothing is here, cat. It's really uh, uh, you know again like I um I immediately turn to you know reading books about healthy relationships uh, slash abusive relationships. Uh, you know, just decades ago, studying, because I just felt that health and mental health literally was just going to be the most important thing. Yeah. And, I mean, most everybody else was chasing after money, and I was always just chasing after fitness. 
on the money's, no, money's no good if you're sick or dying, right? Uh, you know, you know, right. So, like, if if you're not healthy, if you're not, um, look at Steve Jobs, he had all the money in the world, you know, he's still dead. Yeah, and um, you know, like I kind of used to look at it and, and use fitness to kind of like think about money. So it's it's like sort of the muscle to fat ratio um, sort of thing. Like you have to be a healthy person mentally well adjusted and then have money you know in order in order to be you know a, a person that can spend and use their money in healthy ways like if you're not a healthy person you know naturally you're going to misuse money or if you have it you're going to abuse it you know this sort of like um muscle to fat kind of ratio and yeah. that's and that's the problem it's um you know, the, the people who have all the power and who have devalued money, like, on purpose so that they can then turn around and suck the real value out of people. And suck the life out of them, put them on drugs. I mean, drugs, you know, these are all big businesses. Psychotropic drugs, billion-dollar business. Prison, prison uh, industrial uh, complex, yeah. billion-dollar business. You either put them in jail or you put them in a mental prison. Well, you put them in a physical prison by, you know, giving them crappy, uh, poisonous food or poisonous water. I mean, and then, you know, it's just, the evidence of it is everywhere. Yet if you bring it up, you're, you know, you're a crazy person because uh, they've been, they've also been dumbed down and lied to and manipulated uh, by mainstream media to blame uh, the people like us who are pointing these things out for the problem or to ridicule us. I mean, every, I mean, they speak in talking points and aren't even aware that, the, that not only is their opinion been manufactured, but the precise way that they articulate it has been manufactured and they regurgitate it and they tell it to me and they're not even aware of it. I mean, they speak in exact sentences that they all speak the same. They all say, they all the same. Every Republican has the same opinion. Every Democrat has the same opinion. You think that's a coincidence? I mean, you have these little boxes that your mind has been gerrymandered into. I mean, my God, 350 million people in this country and with two opinions or only there's only going to be two possible uh, points of view. It's, it's it's insane. I call people like I feel like people have been genetically modified. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Um, so I just I wanted to get to your art because we're almost to the. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so like, yeah, what is the medium? Oh, I work a uh, variety of mediums. I work on I do sculpture. I do. Digital, I do traditional and digital uh, hybrid. So I work in a lot of different media and a lot of different, for a lot of different um, organizations and media platforms. So the one with the Tin Man. Yeah, that was the story about the end of oil. Or addiction to oil. Right. And who did you do that, that one for? That was for Bloomberg. And what about this one of Hillary uh, with the skull crown on top of her head? Oh, that was uh, that was for Gerald. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, Gerald, uh, I do a lot of work with Gerald because we're kind of um, simpatico, you know. He's, he comes up with a lot of ideas that I, I turn him into uh, visual form. Yeah, I like Gerald. Yeah, he's a sweetheart. Um, and so, like, what are you what are you working on? Do you have anything like coming up? Any sort of um... well, we got the Dick Cheney sculpture contest. Oh yeah. Uh, I was uh, you know the fact that an artist paid fifty thousand dollars to make a bust of this war criminal, and they put it in the Capitol. It really it uh, it disgusted me not only as an artist but as an activist both, uh, which is rare and. Um, I thought, you know, this, I, I contacted the artist that, that, that sculpted this, and I, and I asked him, to, I wanted to interview him, and he's such a coward that he couldn't defend himself, and I wanted to ask him questions, you know, you know, what do you think about Mr. Cheney? What do you think about glorifying this guy who is basically the architect of the Iraq War, which has led to the destruction of the entire Middle East, and thousands of American kids die for nothing, and a million Iraqis displaced or dead, and little kids, but hundreds of thousands dead. 
and you're making a sculpture glorify him. I mean, the idea is that does an artist have is, is it incumbent upon the artist to to not just accept commissions that uh, for their career, but to have some sort of um, moral, uh, you know, equation come into it. You know, is, is there commissions that you should turn down because uh, based on moral grounds? And I do all the time, but this guy apparently is such a coward and that he can't even answer that question. So he, you got no response from him? No, he banned me from Facebook. And <laughs> tell, him, tell him to look up... Uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who's really calling for these people to be, you know, brought up on, you know, war crimes, and especially Dick Cheney. He's always, he's always calling out Dick Cheney as a war criminal. Well, he is a war criminal. Yeah. He, he's, he's been branded a war criminal. He's, he's been several countries have tried him in absentia and convicted him of war crimes and convicted him of torture, convicted him. I mean, he could, you know, Vincent Bugliozzi, the, the former prosecutor just died recently, uh, said he could be convicted for murder for or charged with murder for every single American kid that died. I mean, that there's a law that you could be tried, every single one of those kids that died over there, he could be charged with murder for every single one of them. How is he, how are we going to do that? You have to have one brave prosecutor. It's all it takes. It takes one prosecutor that says that they're not afraid. I mean, they're all afraid. They're afraid. They know the law. They're not stupid, but they, they would be, it would be, uh, you know. I mean, I think if I was a lawyer and prosecutor, I'd do it in a second because what do you got to lose? I mean, this, this is history making. You, you know, you charge these guys and let it, let it be, let the law, let the law decide. So that's what I mean. They're not real lawyers then. No, they're not. They're all cowards. They're, they're afraid of losing their career. That's what, I, that's, why, that's, why, that's what I mean about fitness. Like, what does it matter if you're a judge, a lawyer, a, a cop, or whoever, if you lack inner fitness? That's right. And, and it comes down to people, people are afraid. People are afraid to speak the truth. And that's the other, that's the other problem with this whole uh, police state and surveillance state and self-censorship that, that comes about where people – Say, well, I don't, you know, they're watching everything I say and then they're listening to everything I do and reading every email. I don't want to get in trouble. So, so even when people are, so they're attacking us from so many different levels, so many different angles that they're putting us into tinier and tinier boxes and eventually there'll be nothing left. Anthony Frieda of AnthonyFrieda.com, F-R-E-D-A. Check out his work, his art. And um, send him a, a note on Facebook. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, I hope to see you at, uh, at another event like Occupy Peace. I'll be there. Okay, take care of yourself. You too. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Peace. Peace. Okay, Anthony Frieda. AnthonyFrieda.com. And I'm just going to move straight. To Dr. Dahlia Waspi, that I just recorded this afternoon at one o'clock. Okay, this is a recorded interview with Dr. Dahlia Waspi, who I interviewed once before about a year, maybe two years ago. Uh, Dr. Waspi is an Iraqi American justice activist who has written and spoken extensively on U.S. policy in the region. She's currently writing a book on Iraq, and her piece, which we're going to get to, is called Battling ISIS, Iran-Iraq War Redux. Um, you said, the hawkish Center for Strategic and International Studies boasts January 17th marks an unrecognized milestone. The U.S. has been bombing that country almost continuously for a quarter of a century. In fact, the U.S. bombings over the years were often based on false or dubious rationales, most obviously the 2003 invasion under the pretext of ridding Iraq of non-existent weapons of mass destruction, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. The initial 1991 attack obliterated the infrastructure of Iraq where 
sorry, there were bombings of Iraq throughout the 1990s, including Operation Desert Fox. The illegal U.S. invasion and occupation installed de facto puppet Iraq regimes and orchestrated the bloody sectarian strife that plagues Iraq today. And the bombing raids continue, killing countless innocent Iraqis in their own country. Uh, I'll just read this one um, paragraph, last paragraph. It uh, says, uh, CNN reports, this is from the Institute for Public Accuracy. Um, in CNN reports nearly 19,000 civilians were killed in Iraq between 20, uh, January of 2014 and October of 2015, a toll the United Nations calls staggering in a new report. Um, there's a PDF uh, posted um, on Facebook with your um, with the post for this show later tonight, um, Waspi said today. The figure 19,000 is the number of dead from armed conflict. But previous studies, like the landmark Lancet study, estimate excess deaths due to violence, as well as lack of water, food, shelter, medicine, etc. The study notes, in addition, the number of civilians who have died from secondary effects of armed conflict and violence, such as lack of access to basic food, water, or med medical care, is unknown. So the number dead is higher than 19,000 for this period. We don't know how much higher. Um, the Lancet study estimated 650,000 excess deaths from 2013 invasion. So thank you for joining me, um, Dr. Dahlia Waspi. Thank you so much for having me. Um, okay, so your article is entitled, you said it was six months old, but it's, it's still very relevant, Battling ISIS, Iran-Iraq War Redux. So, yeah, just talk a little bit about what you found. Sure. So, uh, recalling what uh, the U.S. role was in the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s, uh, we uh, officially, uh, the U.S. officially backed uh, Saddam Hussein in uh, fighting Iran. Uh, and then under the table behind uh, Congress's back, the uh, the Reagan administration at that time was arming Iran as well. And that was in secret. When that did come to light, there were a set of hearings known as the Iran Contra hearings uh, because the money that the U.S. made selling arms to Iran was used to fund uh, the paramilitary death squads who were organizing in Latin America, in particular the Contras in Nicaragua. So, uh, so during the Iran-Iraq War, we backed, we ended up, the, the situation was that we were arming both sides in the war, which of course kept both countries uh, weakened and uh, busy with battling each other, which is using up uh, resources and of course using up human lives uh, from each country. And uh, so the U.S. role helped to draw out that war for eight years uh, with a total of uh, about a million casualties combined. Now, what we're seeing today is officially the U.S. has actually installed the government in Iraq, um, which, uh, which happens to have close ties to Iran. Uh, and the government in Iraq is, uh, is a very conservative Shia government. And uh, that has enhanced the influence of Iran in the region. Uh, now, the Western powers recognize that uh, this increased power uh, was a threat to Western control in the region. So they knowingly uh, continued to fund and arm so-called rebels in Syria knowing that the uh, arms and, and funding, uh, they couldn't really control whose hands they ended up in, but they predicted the emergence of uh, an opposing force to the Shia conservatives of its strength, and this emerged as ISIS. And, uh, and we are continuing to fund and arm these so-called rebel groups, uh, which are extremist groups. So at the same time that our official policy is to uh, denounce extremism, we are continuing to fund it, uh, at least, uh, at the very least, indirectly, with our allies uh, like the Saudis um, uh, and uh, 
Turkey and Qatar, uh, for example, they are continuing to uh, to uh, to arm these groups as well. So um, once again, we have a situation with two opposing sides fighting each other. Sometimes ISIS makes an advance, and then sometimes. Iraqi security forces, backed by paramilitary Shia squads uh, or militias, they make an advance. So it's an ongoing battle back and forth that could be another long, drawn-out uh, uh, war over years. Uh, meanwhile, uh, this is uh, this keeps the countries in the whole region weak. Uh, in, in the 80s, it was just Iran and Iraq, but today it's involving uh, so many countries in the region. Uh, and uh, allows us to continue uh, exerting control, and in particular, deciding uh, the control over the, the flow of oil. Uh, and um, you had said, um, right, and it's to strengthen U.S.-Israeli hegemony in that region. In that region. So, how does Israel fit into it all? Well, it's actually the. Israel is our colonial outpost in the region. Uh, we've been uh, a, a long-time supporter of, uh, of the state of Israel uh, really since its creation, and uh, and so that with our by arming and uh, and maintaining such close ties with uh, this ally in, in the region. Um, this is also how we exert control there. So the U.S. and Israel are, are in close collaboration uh, in, in maintaining control over that part of the world. I mean, Israel also has uh, several hundred, uh, uh, or 200 to 400 nuclear warheads. So this is also a means of control there. And uh, recent reports have shown that Israel is the key player in uh, in oil that benefits ISIS in oil being uh, transported out of uh, out of the region and uh, and to buyers. So Israel is facilitating that. So at the same time that again we're formally supporting the um, the regime in Baghdad uh, to fight ISIS. At the same time. Our, our closest ally in the region is facilitating the sale of oil that ISIS gets profits from. So again, it's, uh, it's, it's all very interwoven and, uh, and connected. And so uh, when, when Netanyahu comes out and you know tries to make Israel be the victim against the Palestinian people and present Israel as the one that, that are defending themselves against that, I mean, I mean, like, you know, and then and then Obama with his um, it, right, like, oh, you know, we're 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 combating terrorism, and, and you know, everything is, oh, you know, we're trying to get the terrorists. I mean, I, they clearly know that that is like a facade and just a front. Yeah, then of course this has worked. And in the Bush administration, the facade was we're going to get weapons of mass destruction, right. um, <clears throat> or that Iraq has ties to Al Qaeda, um, or that we're going to liberate the Iraqi people. Uh, now it's that we are we're there to defeat ISIS, which is a force that emerged as a result of our illegal invasion in 2003. And that continues to thrive because of our pouring of funding and weapons into the region. Um, so this is <clears throat> it's a lot of double talk that, unfortunately, because we remain uh, a nation of fear in the U.S., uh, that uh, this is very it's a good sell to the American people um, without recognizing that you know that our our really our the greatest threat come from uh, within our own country. If you look right now at what's happening to Flint, Michigan, and the way that uh, government corruption and uh, ignorance and inhumanity has uh, created a tremendous health problem for the people of Flint. I mean, that's how that's how a, a local U.S. government treats its own people. Right. Um, so it's not surprising when we have such a, when we demonstrate such a lack of respect for human life overseas as well. But this is this is the the big picture. We're not recognizing that um, really uh, greatest threat to to our 
um, secured here at home is uh, is the economic threat and the condition of our system here and the dilapidated infrastructure that continues to uh, to deteriorate while billions of dollars are spent on fighting fighting wars overseas, uh, unnecessary wars, uh, and those billions of tax dollars can be used for uh, really supporting the country here at home. And we, we can't even really um, technically call it a war, can we? Um, it, that's a good point. Um, it's absolutely framed as a war, and thank you for um, for uh, picking up on on that use. Yeah, I should not. I should not use the administration's language <laughs> because it really is. Um, you know, there's no. Uh, ISIS does not have any airplanes, and these are not two equal warring nations. Uh, this is uh, there's not a beautiful force that's on the ground, but it's not going to be defeated by military might. Right, and they're 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 not our real enemy. I mean, there's no real enemy. These people are not. I mean, they 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 didn't made to be terrorists. It's and it's not. It, yeah, the agenda. The issue is that it's certainly our policies, which and this has been the case for for years upon years, that it's our own policies that have created our enemies. Um, so, and it, uh, there's certainly the the. Um, the actions of this group are, are horrific, of uh, the ISIS group are horrific, but what nobody has talked about is the, that, that their, these heinous acts are exactly what the U.S.-backed Iraqi government has been doing to the Iraqi people since we helped them come to power. And of course, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, and the emergence of ISIS is in response to the brutality uh, yet another U.S. sponsored regime in Iraq. I'm glad you said that because I am always talking about natural law, and you know it doesn't. Nobody gets over on it, and you know the powers that be, you know they use it when they want to use it, and then but then when uh, it, it exposes them, you know as as the war criminals or something like that, or or the torture report comes out, uh, oh, you know nobody gets held accountable. That's right. And that's what really what we've seen. Um, you know, there was no accountability after the uh, illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003. And without accountability, without any um, justice served, the war crimes continue. And we've expanded now, although the um, we recently passed the 25th anniversary of the initiation of, of assaults on military aggression against Iraq. The, our warfare has expanded uh, to Libya, uh, to Syria, our close allies, Saudi Arabia, and bombing Yemen with weapons that we sold to Saudi Arabia. And look at the difference in how we treated, back in 1991, how we treated Iraq's military aggression on Kuwait as compared to Saudi Arabia's military aggression on Yemen. There's a full double standard there because we have it, whatever serves our economic interests drives our policy. There's nothing humanitarian about it. There is no rule of law being uniformly applied. And that's actually why people hate us, is because our, our policies and our hypocrisy are killing their families. And, and people, when we push people to extremes, that's exactly where they go. What the crisis in the region today does not have a military solution. There has to be, uh, first and foremost, there, ha there needs to be a ceasefire. Because as this recent UN report showed, and as these UN reports have continued to show, civilians, the innocent people on the ground, are paying the highest price uh, for, uh, for our access to, to the oil resources of the region. And I think um, it was William Hartung that I interviewed. Uh, who did an article about um, U.S. weapons sales and um, and said that? Sorry, I just like lose my train of thought. Um, okay, you know, like how um, you know, just keep you know keeping the, the the weapons just going, you know, so the weapons in industries can just completely profit. 
Um, that's absolutely, absolutely the case. If you look at the profit margins for Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, um, these are the these are the big winners. Uh, and of course, those those companies, uh, the, these cor- corporations, feed money into re-election congressional re-election campaigns. Uh, and also, uh, war is also uh, great for Wall Street. Um, Wall Street also has tremendous influence uh, over the Democratic, Na- Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee. So this is those are really that's who's driving our policies. Um, but the majority, of it, the vast majority of us, not only within the United States but uh, globally, uh, have nothing to do with Wall Street. We have uh, a, a tiny fraction of uh, of wealth, and that's why that's why people are are standing up and pushing so hard now for for living wages. That people are living are are being paid wages that uh, that you cannot live on, you can't survive on within within our system here. And so, really, that's who's, that's how we can recognize who our allies are. We have more in common with the victims overseas, the people on the ground, than we do with our own government. Okay, so two things. Um, the point that I was that actually trying to get to before about William Hartom, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was the one um, who, because uh, I asked him, like, why aren't other countries, like, intervening? And, um, you know, he, he mentioned, like, the country of uh, France and I think even Russia and how instead of trying to uh, stop the U.S. and what it's doing and all these wars, they're actually jumping on the bandwagon to, you know, to, to profit off of these soldiers. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, the attacks in, uh, in Paris um, several months ago now, um, uh, when those took place, that was uh, that the French president decided that that was reason, despite the fact that uh, some of the attackers came from Belgium, that some of them were French, uh, it seemed like a good enough reason to go bomb, bomb Iraq and Syria. Um, and what Russia is doing, now they're actually, as they see the U.S. Uh, uh, really entrenching control in the region, Russia is trying to lay its claim as well. Um, and this is, again, a huge tragedy for the people on the ground. If you look at Syria, the, the Syrian people are are trying to survive ISIS. They're trying to survive uh, U.S. bombing raids. Now they have to endure Russian bombing raids, and that's how people are becoming displaced and uh, isolated from food and water. And there's a very desperate humanitarian situation there. That's that's the ultimate uh, end of uh, consequence. Of, uh, of the military aggression and humanitarian crisis on the ground. And then, so you mentioned wages also, um, because I, I find a lot of kind of blind patriotism going on in this country. Um, you know, like, like, how, like how the American people don't know that this, I mean, and they, they, a lot of people, because it was just a couple of weeks ago, there was a small closed Guantanamo action at Times Square, and a tourist kind of came by. I think he took a picture, and he said, you know, uh, aren't the people that blew up the World Trade Centers in Guantanamo? I mean, you know, like, you know, that, that's what people believe. People believe the official story. And that's, that's the power of the mainstream media. Um, and that's the, you know, credit to you and, and thank you again for the opportunity that, you know, there's alternative media sources for, um, for every one of us to turn to and to, to be a part of, to try to expose the truth. But they're really the propaganda campaigns that certainly have, um, psychologists involved in, uh, I mean, it's very much, this is advertising and marketing policies uh, to the American people just as much as, as it is a, uh, it's the same work that they do to promote products on television. So this is a very, um, very big industry, and the media has been, the mainstream media have, uh, have been complicit in selling lies to people, and so it's no wonder that people are so ill-informed, and they're, 
they have to work two or three jobs, uh, if Americans in this country to, uh, because they're low wage jobs just to try to put food on the table. So they don't have time to, uh, to dig up for alternative media. So they just hear the, you know, sound bites here and there. So it's a very, very effective campaign. Um, but we, you know, we keep going with those of us who have access to, to, to the truth. We have an obligation to share it uh, to, uh, with as many people as we can and to continue to, to advocate to the victims of our policies and, and whether they're here at home or, or around the world. I mean, but shouldn't those um, Americans working those three jobs for the low wages um, kind of say, you know, hey, wait a minute, like there's something wrong with this. I mean, look at what my own country is doing to me. You know, to, to I think that's. I think, and that's what we're starting to see now. That's what we're starting to see now. And, and you know, people, there has to be a certain threshold. There has to be exactly. a tipping point that, that is reached. And I think that's where people are now. Um, it's just, it's basic survival. Uh, now, it's nothing compared to uh, the survival of uh, the people in Iraq or Syria and Yemen, where they're literally, their, their lives are on the line. Um, but this is the kind of now people are starting to say enough is enough, and um, and you know that it's playing out. It's playing out. The the empire is crumbling. I honestly, I, I guess it was visual thinking. I thought it would have crumbled and uh, and and collapsed uh, a few years ago, but uh, but it's still there's a there's a large a large amount of questioning and uh, people with the attitude of I'm not going to take this anymore. Um, so, uh, also, you know, Trump talking about the refugees and not letting them in, and you know, again, like that we might be letting in terrorists if we if we let in these refugees. I mean, what do you think? Yes, yeah, the the large large majority of the people who are refugees, you become a refugee because you're you're running for your life and you have nowhere to go. Um, and they're seeking, they're seeking, that's what I call refugees, because they're seeking refugees. Um, and this is really, this is, again, part of the media campaign, uh, you know, that there's a lot of attention drawn to the presidential race, which I really, again, uh, it, Wall Street is ultimately, uh, historically, the, the group that decides the elections, depending on who gets the, the biggest funding. So I'm, I don't pay too much attention to the presidential race on, on either side, which is really it's the same side. Um, but um, this is the kind of fear mongering that uh, that is is part of the show, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there's a very uh, it's tapping into uh, a significant uh, uh, segment of the population that's in agreement with it. Um, so it's, uh, I'm not saying it's unimportant because it, it, ha it is having uh, significant consequences and it's making life very difficult and not dangerous for Muslims living here um, and, and Muslims who are seeking to come here. Um, even though that should not be, you know, that, that whole characterization is, is unfair. It's, I mean, it reminds me of sort of, a, of the classification of Jews in Germany. Um, where uh, Jews were targeted as the, the problem with the country. Uh, and this is also, uh, and now in this day and age in this country, Muslims are being targeted as a scapegoat. So these are ugly times. Um, and so, you know, that, but as more people are waking up, they're pulling out more and more stops, I think, to try to silence the masses. Uh, but... We'll see if the if the tipping point has been reached for people who are aware and uh, and willing to uh, to fight back against the system that is keeping them down. Right, like you know, for people to see that they're the ones keeping this system going, because like what I see a lot of that really disturbs me. Uh, right, you know, rather than challenging the powers that be, I mean, it's just like literally. I mean, I just feel like it's a no-brainer that it's the powers that be, like the corporations, the people at the top that need to be challenged. They get no challenge, and yet what do the people turn around and do? They they put more challenge on the people that need it the less. Like, 
you know, the people that already you know have more than their fair share of, of challenges and you know um, right. setbacks and you know it, it's like people join in on abusing the innocent rather than turning yeah. it towards the people the bullies. Well, that's a good point because the, they're easier targets. Uh, and, and it's a very good analogy of the bully and the bully's victims. Um, it's a, you go after the easier target, for sure. Right. Um, and that's what, and we're kind of, our whole country has a bully mentality. Right. Like look at our foreign policy. Right. Um, anyone can look at our foreign policy and see how, uh, how aggression <laughs> is the, is the name of the game, um, or threats, uh, to be compliant, uh, with, with our way of, of doing things um, is very much a bullying mentality. So we should not be surprised that we have such a bullying problem amongst the youth of this country. They're, whether whether consciously or not, they're modeling the behavior that, that they see that, that might is right. Um, so it's, it's a very, very challenging time, um, but we can, let's see how, I, I think we're seeing signs that more and more people are unhappy with the status quo and uh, and challenging the authorities uh, of the of the status quo rather than uh, joining in with the bullying. Right. right. We have to turn it around and challenge the bullies and stop bullying the. the I mean, that's clearly the, how the debt gets perpetuated. I mean, if you just really look at that. That's exactly, you know, what keeps perpetuating debt. And, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, environmentally also, because ultimately the environment is going to, is, is also picking up the tab, along with the most vulnerable people on the planet. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, you know, some of the most, the, the number one user of fossil fuels is the U.S. military. And, uh, of course, the, um, the utilization of fossil fuels has uh, done a lot to contribute to climate change. Um, so there's, uh, you know, at this point we're in uh, we're in the extreme phase of it. Uh, so and there's not not anything we can do at this point to cause a significant turnaround on what's going to happen. But that doesn't mean that we give up and lay down. Um, there are small changes that every one of us make uh, in terms of uh, the choices we make for how we eat, how we live. Um, and I, I believe uh, every one of those choices really does matter, um, even though it's on a tiny scale and it's as the individual. That, that's really ultimately the only control we have in this crazy world. Um, so I do believe those choices matter. Um, and I'm continually learning myself, um, <clears throat> trying to adjust. Uh, my living uh, conditions and my eating habits to, yeah. to be better to exactly. the other residents of this planet and uh, to be kinder to the animals and the environment. Um, it's so all of us, every one of us can, uh, can, can adjust something and I, I'm <coughs> myself included in, in that category. Thank you so much, Dolly Yawaski, uh, Iraq American justice activist and your uh, writing that is including uh, battling ISIS, Iran, Iraq, war, we just. Catherine, thank you so much for having me back. Thanks for the opportunity. You're very welcome. Keep up the good work. You too. Okay, bye. Bye, Catherine. Thank bye. you. You're welcome. Bye. Okay, and um, before I play the last 10 minutes of the interview with uh, on the mental health system, particularly at Manhattan Psychiatric Hospital on Ward's Island with Dr. Seth Farber. I uh, want to please ask people to go to Awake Radio 1 YouTube channel and uh, please support organic news. Um, without alternative media, all you're going to get is genetically modified media from the mainstream that are just going to keep feeding you the official, you know, BS. And, 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 and your kids and grandkids are just going to be living in a devastated uh, planet. Uh, so back to Dr. Seth Farber, and I just have to cue it up. Okay, this is a... Uh, an overall feeling of, of indifference 
industries, okay. ISIS. Yeah. It's always the same over and over and over again. The the help and the thing that's supposed to be helping ah, is yeah. making yeah. everything worse. And that's what it's supposed to be doing. So again, you said she's not, you know, the doctor said she's not responding to the drugs. So, uh, I mean, but like, she, you know, again, she is responding to the drugs. But taking her off of them is never an option. Like they they keep doing more of what doesn't work, even so, though they're, uh, they're actually giving more marijuana picks. And now they're saying she's responding because she's not even diagnosed. That it, she she might not be an antagonistic because the drug is turning into a zombie. So that's what I mean. But also because Joe can talk to her every day, so she doesn't feel as angry as hopeless. You know, when I first met, met her there, I not having seen her in many years, she said she was dying. So I, this became a kind of metaphor, although they're, 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 she claims, which may be true, they treat everything she says as delusion, but she gave a very, to me, cogent account of how she was treated at, at uh, investigated at Mount Sinai. For uterine cancer, and they told her she needed to have a biopsy. When I want to follow up on this, she's been there a year without anyone, uh, they claim, apparently they claim that they did follow up on this. I don't know. I mean, you can't trust what the psychiatrists say because they treat everything uh, that the patient says is delusion. Um, she has that, she, you know, she makes some statements that are, that are, are delusional. Uh, if you want to use that term, but um, this may not be. She's not being, uh, no one's called the hospital and, and, and made sure that if she had a uh, uh, need to have a biopsy, that a biopsy was done. So this is eight months later. Um, also, she she can't, uh, I think she's still there without, without her glasses. And they never made any effort to, uh, to remedy that. So we are, we only have a, a couple of minutes left, um, so I'm just going to ask uh, yourself and then Joe to kind of make um, like a closing statement. Or I mean, what is there anything anybody can do to help? I mean, are you are you are you you know calling on all um, re real doctors out there to uh, possibly you know get involved and help get. Uh, like a real diagnosis for this real treatment for Linda Andre, who wrote Doctors of Deception and helped her to get released out of Kirby, what is it, Kirby uh, Medical Facility? The ability to stay psychiatric, Kirby is for criminals. Um, she committed no criminal act. So. Okay, well, Joe told me the name of the place is called Kirby. It's called it, Kirby. Okay, and it's at 125th Street. No, it's Dunlop, I'm sorry. Kirby is one, Dunlop is another, and Myers is third. She's in Dunlop. Okay, Dunlop. So, um, how, 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 so how do people get in touch with you if they want to help Linda? Oh, okay. Yeah, they can call me at, uh, I mean, it's not all of you, the address here. 646 uh, Joe, is there any uh, last words that you would like to share? Well, there, when we try to get help, um, there's not too many people who want to go against the system. So, like, our hands are tied. We know there is help out there. There are a few psychiatrists who know the game, but we're really outnumbered. And uh, nobody wants to change anything because everybody's lives are at stake, you know, their jobs yeah. or their fake whatever. Jobs. Huh? Their fake jobs. Yeah, their safe jobs. And, um, you know, they're very good. And the people who do help us, I do appreciate that. They, they give us great advice, but they're not really the ones to go and help them. Like, uh, you know, people could call me 24 hours a day. Um, I go to court, I'll help people. Uh, get on the right track. Uh, I said in the court that um, I will take her and help her get to get out of meetings, um, to go to her appointments and stuff if they would help to release her. And me as a legally blind 
adults, mean with my cane, you know, I can still take her to and from places, and they still wouldn't really uh, let her go. And now it's just a waiting game now. And, uh, you know, I don't know what to do because the girl is in there suffering. She probably wants to call somebody. The neuroleptic drugs are just making her um, uh, negative that down. She's not thinking. She's just biding time, sitting there watching TV, eating. She's not sleeping well. Can people visit her? If anybody, I mean, if any, anybody wants to go visit her? They well, can... yeah, I think uh, there's people that can go visit her. That would actually help more because they would see that she has more friends. And people, and uh, maybe they uh, wouldn't drug her so much to see that she is not even the home and no, 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 that no. she has. But they probably think now she's very isolated by herself, and they don't have anybody, and that's the best people to keep. Like, you know, when people are psychiatric and they're criminals, and they have their mind, those are the ones that they let go because they won't, they're not workable. But the ones who are uh, compliant, you know, that's the ones that we can drug up, and that's the ones we can experiment on, and by the time she gets out of there, she'll be brain dead. You know, she would have gotten out this last time that had she said, I think it was clear, yes. well, so what was done, what, what I presented that was news to the judge, despite his tendency to refer to the psychiatric establishment, was that Linda was not, was somebody, you know, puts in their eyes upon a mental patient, nobody. But that she was somebody because she'd written a book, she had all the kind of accomplishments. So he spoke to her with uh, more respect. And I was able to get this out the, the second time. The first time I wasn't able to show her book and all. So actually, yeah. the willing to say. next time I'm sure she'll say what they wanted to say, which is, yes, Your Honor, I know I have a mental illness. I know I need to take the treatment. I believe if she says that, they'll let her go. We'll see. If she's been sentenced to another three months, she didn't say that. But if she said, yes, Your Honor, she did agree to the treatment, but she didn't go so far as to say, yes, I know, those are the magic words. Yes, I know I have a mental illness. Yes, I will get treatment for my mental illness, uh, etc. Um, yeah, but uh, heaven forbid the judges and the psychiatrists ever admit that they're the ones that have a, a mental illness. That heaven forbid they should ever admit that they're in it for the money and not for helping people. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I, mean, I don't know which American in the chief said, but the love of money is a disease with them. Okay, uh, we're pretty uh, much we're pretty much out of time. Did you want to uh, give a phone number out? Yeah, I wanted to give Linda's phone number. Okay. Uh, 646-672-6757. And, uh, say, you know, say it again. Five and six is, the, uh, I think, that well, the best time to reach her because the phone is off the hook most of the, the time. And they, they put it on it between uh, five and six, and maybe sometime in the morning, Joe knows, I don't know when you can count on it, but five and six is a good time. Six four six six seven two six seven five seven. And they could also call you to get that number. Right. Well, yeah, they can all they could also call me, you know, I'm not I'm available. I have a phone, it's two one two six three one 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 eight. Again, that's two one two six three one 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 eight. Just uh, tell me what the situation is. If you're in trouble and you need some help or you want to talk, just leave a phone number. And uh, if you have somebody in a similar situation like this, you know, there are people out here who can help you. Okay, thank you so much to the both of you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Okay, so that is Excuse me. <laughs> that again was Dr. Seth Farber who wrote the spiritual gift of madness, and um, his, uh, his assistant that just wanted to be referred to as Joe, about Linda Andre, who wrote a book, Doctors of Deception, Who Needs Help, uh, and her number again, 646-672-6757. And I could definitely use your support at the Awake Radio number one with no spaces, organic news on YouTube. Please share the podcast. Please 
send a, note, a donation if you could. At least share so we um, get alternative views and alternative media out there. So thank you. Good night.